Welcome to First Tuesdays. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jennifer Fenton from the Washington State Library. And with me today is Carolyn Peterson, my co-host. And she's also at the State Library. Did you want to say hi, Carolyn? Hello. Glad you all made it here. And also with us are our two very important people, Joe and Jeremy. They are providing tech support today. So if you have a question, you may want to jot down their emails or phone numbers so that if you have any um, technical issues, you're able to contact them directly. You can also send a message in chat. They will be monitoring that today. First Tuesdays is brought to you by the Washington State Library and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So uh, just another reminder, I know I've, we've mentioned this a couple times, is to go ahead and type in chat um, where you are from, uh, what library or city state um, you are joining us from, and that will give everyone a sense of who all's here. And I can see looking at the room, we have over 35 people here. So, And if you have more than one person under, under one login, please go ahead and let us know that so we can uh, get an accurate count. So today, I get the honor of introducing um, to you a couple of superstars of the library world, Brianna and Doris. And uh, I met them a couple years ago at uh, a whale conference, which is our support staff annual association conference. And Doris was running around troubleshooting all the equipment. Uh, and taking care of any tech issues that arose. And Brianna was welcoming, and we got into a conversation about young adult literature. And then later on, I found out that both of these young women were pages at the Richland Library. And I was quite impressed that they were both so knowledgeable and had such uh, vast experience in libraries, and also are very passionate about libraries. Um, Doris just started school yesterday, so she is in class today. So she and Brianna put this presentation together. And generally, they do this presentation as a dynamic duo. And today, Brianna gets to carry the show by herself. But I have confidence that she can do that. And if you have questions for them, there will be time for you to ask uh, questions for Brianna. And I'm pretty sure that they're both willing to answer questions afterwards by email. Uh, so anyways, it is my pleasure to turn this over to Brianna. I also just wanted to let you know another thing that Brianna has been doing is that she has been very involved in our Washington Library Association and recently was appointed to the Continuing Education Committee. And she also has been involved in uh, AALA, American Library Association, in various capacities. So she's been quite a leader in libraries for these past couple years. And so, Brianna, please take it away. Thank you, Jennifer, for that beautiful introduction. I really appreciate that. And thank you to the Washington State Library for asking us to um, do this presentation for the first Tuesday series. Doris and I were honored and excited to be able to do this. And as Jennifer said, Doris won't be joining us today, but we are so proud of her here at our library in Richland that she has started her college classes yesterday. So as Jennifer said, I'll be taking this on myself. So I'm really hopeful that you get some useful information from the presentation today. And also, I'm just floored and excited to see so many people from all around the country. I honestly was not expecting to see so many people from all over. So welcome, and I really hope that you enjoy it and get some things to take back to your library. So the purpose of this presentation is essentially engaging the page and using your pages and shelvers in things that could be considered a non-traditional role, um, such as aspects of operational efficiency, space planning, departmental organization, and I'm even going to talk a little bit about some programming and some other things that your pages could be involved in. First of all, I want to give everyone a little overview of what I plan to cover in the presentation this morning. The first thing I want to talk about is the Richland Public Library. 
I want to tell you a little bit about our library just to kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from and the environment that Doris and I work in, because I imagine it's probably a little different than from where everyone else is from. I'm going to talk about projects as well and a little bit about the projects that we've been involved in in the past and as well as what we're currently involved in. That way maybe you can get some ideas about what your pages can do or just some ideas about other ways to use them. One thing that I really want to talk about too is shelf counting. I don't know if anybody is familiar with this tool, but it's one of the most valuable tools that we use when it comes to shifting collections and evaluating space. And this is usually Doris's baby, and she kind of came up with this herself, but I will do my best to explain it so you can take it back to your library and possibly incorporate it. I want to talk about space planning and how your pages can take an active role in those discussions and how their views can be valued in making those types of decisions. We're going to talk a little bit about our experiences with programming in the hopes of giving you some ideas how pages can be more involved in your library's programming, as well as some ways on that we've gotten involved in the Washington Library Association and maybe other ways that your pages can get involved in your own state associations. Talk a little bit about training and give you some possible ideas on how you can utilize the skills of your pages to train others. And one of the most important things I want to talk about towards the end of the presentation is the importance of mentoring and the ideas of succession for pages. We're going to end the presentation talking about the page perspective and a little bit about how that perspective is valuable in the library and reiterate how important empowerment is in our position. So the Richland Public Library is a standalone city library in Richland, Washington. As you can see, we went through a major remodel a few years ago, and we nearly doubled our space. And we're lucky to have the support of the city behind us in passing our bond for the remodel. And we were able to add some really great features to our library, like multiple study rooms, lots of public meeting space, and a beautiful second floor. And right here, this is some construction pictures. We actually were able to keep the original brick wall, which everyone was really excited about. This is Jack, one of our therapy dogs. I stuck him in here because he's my favorite, and I would take Jack home in a heartbeat. And this is the library as it is remodeled today. So we are pretty proud of it, and the city absolutely loves it as well. Just a couple notes about our circulation. We've been noticing some fluctuation in actual physical circulation, but our meeting room use is through the roof, and we're really creating a strong web presence with our online book club, and we're very proud of our ebook and e-reader lending. As far as our staff's concerned, we have 32 staff members, which is equivalent to about 19 and a half full-time staff members. This includes full-time, permanent part-time, and intermittent staff, including our administration, circulation staff, technical services, reference librarians, pages, and volunteers. Teresa and I are currently the only permanent part-time pages, though we haven't been spending a whole lot of time in the stacks the last couple of years with our other projects. But we also have intermittent pages as well as other inter intermittent circulation staff that have regular shelving hours. It's time to start talking about some projects. The first project I want to talk about is shifting. Shifting is basically what it boils down to is just moving a collection from one place to another. And there are many reasons to do this shifting. Collections outgrow their space. A better location for a collection may be determined after evaluating your floor, your floor space. And shifting is definitely not fun, but it is a necessity. And using your time wisely when shifting leads to maximum productivity. And pages may be one of the best sources when it comes to reevaluating your floor space. Pages really know the stacks very well. They're working the floor constantly. And they really may have an idea of a really good place for collections to be shifted. And what it really comes down to is the pages are doing the work usually when it comes to shifting. And unnecessary shifts just end up being a waste of everyone's time. 
When it comes to planning a shift, you really have to take into consideration of who's doing the work, and nobody is going to benefit from any waste of time regardless of who's doing it. And at the end of the day, a failed plan is nothing more than a failed plan. And a good example of that is what Doris and I like to call the legend of the large print. Now, we've talked to our supervisors quite a few times about this, and they are totally on board with us telling this story, even though it's a terrible story in the end. And it's a really perfect example of a failure to utilize all of the available resources. And really kind of a failure to see the big picture regarding the space available and not using your pages as the resources for that. When it came to the large print, when we remodeled the building, the original floor plan was developed by a planning committee that consisted of only supervisors, and nobody else was really asked for any advice. Now, when the pages were in here during the end of the remodel and talking about the floor plan, we walked the space and suggested rather insistently that the floor space be reevaluated. And our requests were pretty much repeated or dismissed repeatedly. Once we got moved into the building and they figured out that, yeah, the space really wasn't going to work very well, two months and six separate shifts later, our mat the material was finally on the shelf exactly the way we suggested it in the first place. Basically, it added up to hours of wasted time, and we did receive an apology at the end, and it did kind of lead to this kind of a new way of thinking about using us when it came to the floor space. And now we're regularly taken back to an area and asked our advice on how we feel that the space could be utilized more efficiently. So even though it was such a crazy project and took so much time, it really ended up good things coming out of it since now we're used in that capacity a little bit more. Along with shifting is shelf counting. And as I said, this was kind of Doris's baby, kind of an idea that she came up with. And you might use it in your library in a little different way and maybe call it something different. But it's a little bit of a trick of the trade that we like to call it. And I knew when I started, um, when I started shelving, I knew that Doris liked me when she took me back to the stacks one day and basically told me, hey, I'm going to teach you how to count shelves. It was like once she said that, I was, yeah, okay, I'm in. She likes me. So since then, it's really been a lifesaver when it comes to moving collections, especially if you're considering a large-scale move. If you have multiple floors in your library and you're considering moving one collection upstairs and the other one downstairs, you really have to evaluate your space to see how many shelves you need and if the collection's even going to fit. So basically the rule of shelf counting comes down to you need one extra shelf for every three full shelves. Depending on how full you like to keep your shelves, we personally like to go, probably this shelf right here would be our maximum, which is about three quarters of the way. So looking at these shelves on this side, you can see that you've got one, two, three, pretty much full shelves, so you're going to need a whole new shelf to spread those out. So by going through your space and going through each row and each stack, you can really count your shelves and see what you need as far as space is, con is concerned. And by doing that, to know what you need, you're going to end up moving your material one time. And the theory behind it is if you, if you put forth the time and the effort to do it, it's going to be done right the first time. And it takes a lot less time than having to do the, the same thing twice or six times in two months like we did before. And what you end up with is a real clear mental image of the end result. You're walking the material, you're counting. It's very simple. It doesn't take very long. And in our experience that we've been using it, it's pretty close to fail-proof. So it's a really great planning procedure that you can use regularly in your library as far as when it comes to moving space. And even I've started to think about it a little bit when it comes to weeding. 
when you're out weeding material, you can go out after you've pulled the material that needs to be withdrawn, and you can go and count your shelves. If you end up with really empty shelves, you can count how many extra shelves you have after weeding. And maybe you can plan to spread your collection out and shift it, or you're going to know how many extra shelves you have if you want to move your collection completely. When I think about pages and shelvers, I often think about it as kind of being in the trenches. Pages and shelvers are often the first contact that patrons have out on the floor. I know in my experience when I'm out shelving, patrons are coming up to me all the time and asking me where things are. They're, going, they're coming to us and not sometimes going to the desk. So really, your pages are like your first line of library defense. And one of the most important things I like to reiterate with pages and talk about is the importance of professionalism. You are this first contact for people. They chose you to come to for help. You have to smile, be professional, know your library, and know your procedures. If you're not supposed to you know, take people and do these ready reference questions, take them to the desk. But know what you're doing and be courteous and respectful for your patrons. So now I want to talk a little bit about space planning and how the page perspective can help you when it comes to space planning. One of the most common occurrences in a library is reevaluating space. We're constantly getting new books. We're constantly weeding books. Collections grow and outgrow their designated areas. And honestly, your shifting only goes so far. So when it's time to move a collection, the page can have a pivotal role because of our unique perspective. Do your pages have an idea of where the collection should be moved? Do they have an idea of how the flow of your library can be improved? Ask them. By using their knowledge of the library, Pages can really contribute some great ideas where to move collections in order to better serve your patrons. It's also very important to be proactive as a page to maybe bring up these ideas that you have. If you're out and you're shelving and the flow of the shelving is not, just isn't working and isn't flowing right, be proactive and tell your supervisor. It's not always up to them to include you and they might not even think about it. So by being proactive and taking that step to kind of say, hey, I was thinking about something. Have we ever considered on moving the collection here or having the space flow like this? For one, it really shows initiative on the page's part. And for two, like I said, it might be something that your supervisor may never have thought about. So it's a unique and new perspective to bring up. Being proactive is very important in our position. So uh, now that we've talked a little bit about projects and space planning, I want to talk a little bit about programming, specifically the experiences that Doris and I have had with programming and the opportunities that we've gotten from being involved with the programming at our library. One of the most interesting programming opportunities that we've had in the last couple of years was last April when the Richland Public Library hosted the Manhattan Project Communities Conference. And this brought together library representatives from the three secret cities of the Manhattan Project, which was Richland, Washington, Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And it was a really big deal in our area, so it was kind of a high profile event for us. For our roles, Jerice was asked to put her technical skills to work and be responsible for the audio vis video setup and the troubleshooting. And her role was really important because we were doing this sort of kind of like I'm doing here, these live webcasts, but it included video. And she had to make sure that all that was working from people in Los Alamos, New Mexico and Tennessee. So she really had a, had a lot to do in making sure that worked seamlessly. And there was a lot of security around it, so she had to work with that as well. So for myself, 
I was asked to take notes during the actual librarian meetings, and I was even able to put together the presentation that was given to the rest of the conference and to the rest of the librarians. And it was a really good opportunity for us to kind of use our skills in a high profile event, and we looked at it as kind of a test to see what we could do. And when these opportunities come up that are kind of out of the ordinary, so to speak, it can be really beneficial to look to your pages that may have some useful skills for the project that you didn't think about. National Night Out was another program that we've been involved in for the last couple of years. And this is a citywide program sponsored by the City of Richland and Target Stores. National Night Out is a National Night Out Against Drugs and Alcohol, and it's also sponsored in or in partner with our uh, Richland Police Department. And it's been a really successful event for the city, and they've doubled their projected attendance every year the last couple of years. And what it really is is kind of a, almost a city fair for city organizations to come and, and have a real family-friendly event. And the library had a table where we set up carnival, carnival games and gave out prizes to the kids. And Doris and I were basically recruited to man, to man our booth for the carnival games. And last summer, it was 107 degrees, and we sweated in the park for five and a half hours. But it was a really good time, and it was a really fun thing to be a part of, and a great opportunity to really meet people in the city and promote our library. And being involved in these type of community-wide programs is a special experience for us, because as Jennifer mentioned in the introduction, Doris and I love our library, and being able to promote it within our community is a real source of pride for us. And your pages may have the same feelings, and given the opportunities, they can really shine in an event like this. Probably the largest program that Doris and I have been involved in in the last years has got to be the Washington Library Employee Conference. And Jennifer mentioned a little bit about that as well. And a little history about that is I decided to open my mouth to my director a few years ago, being, you know, proactive and all, and tell her how I would like to eventually, a few years down the road, do a conference session at a conference. I was lucky enough that she looked at me and said, what are you waiting for? Now, I didn't feel I was lucky at the time. In fact, I was freaking out. But the encouragement that she gave me to basically say, skip the, ba skip the baby steps and just go for it, really led to Doris and I being session presenters at Whale in 2010 and 2011. And because of this experience in presenting and with the help of our mentors, Doris and I were able to network with the conference planning committee the first year. And we ended up being on the committee ourselves the following year. Now, I don't think we intended to be on the committee or take on the two subcommittees that we did in 2011, since we just went to the initial meeting for information. But that's what we ended up doing. And really, that's what happens sometimes. Sometimes you just go for information, and you find something that just is kind of too fun to pass up. And that's kind of how well started for us. We went to just see what it was about, and it just kind of clicked for us. So after those subcommittee roles, we decided to take on a larger responsibility, and we became conference co-chairs for last year's conference. And we had a lot to live up to. The conference in 2011 in Spokane was so amazing that we weren't really sure if we could match it. But we had a really great conference committee, and their talent and experience, as well as, honestly, their faith in us and their supportive attitudes really helped us put on a successful conference. And it's been a really enlightening experience for us, and we've learned so much about what we can do and what we're capable of. The possibility to take on these roles as pages, it's definitely there. And what I think surprised us the most is you know, the support is there as well. Doris and I found ourselves constantly saying, oh, but we're just pages. And our committee was right there to tell us that, that didn't matter. The committee was from all over the state, and they were incredibly supportive. 
and making those connections over the last couple years has really given us a built-in support system. And our library and library director has also been very supportive and encouraging. Without their support pushing us to do it, we wouldn't be able to do it. Now, when I talk about whale, I like to say that whale has kind of been my baby because I've been involved in it for the last few years. But it's probably more accurate to say that I have been whale's baby. I feel like I've done a lot of growing up with whale. And just those roles that I've taken have encouraged me to take on more roles in WLA. And Doris as well has also taken on a new role for whale. As this year, she is the vice chair of the whale interest group. And next year, she will be the chair of the interest group. So even if you think that you're just a page, if you have that support and encouragement behind you, getting involved in something as large scale as a statewide conference, those possibilities are there. So Tech Thursday is probably the newest little program that Doris and I have become involved in. Between Whale and other library things going on, we haven't taken on a whole lot of new projects. And of course, with school as well, it's been, it's been difficult to kind of balance everything. But Tech Thursday is a drop-in class that we hold every Thursday from 2 to 4 PM. And in this class, we give one-on-one -on -one or small group assistance on all types of technology needs. People come in with anything from e-readers to email help, cell phones, Xenio, and really anything else you can think of that's technology related. Now, I've said it a few times, but Doris is very tech savvy. And she really know, knows her stuff when it comes to technology. And I really enjoy it as well. And I went to our director and basically offered to start doing the classes. And it's been a really great experience to be able to do some teaching. And a lot of the patrons that come in from 2 to, from two to 4 in the afternoon are seniors. And they come in with their nooks and their Kindles saying, you know, my son or daughter got this for me, and I have no idea how to use it. And to be able to sit down with them and teach them, and then when they start doing it themselves, it's really a great feeling, and it's super rewarding. And Joyce and I have even started to kind of get our regulars that come in specifically to see us. And we really love helping them and hearing their stories. And this jump in responsibility has kind of made us start to think of other things to kind of build on this. We only do classes on Thursday afternoons. But Doris and I are considering doing an evening class once or twice a month. How it kind of turns out for us and maybe for other pages out there is a little responsibility kind of makes us want more. That's the thing with pages. At least for us, you give us an inch and we'll take a mile. Now I want to talk a little bit about something that you may not have associated with pages, and that's training and what the pages role can be in that. Now, we've all dealt with budget constraints. It's really a, it's our reality in the library world. It's not only do more with less, but it's other duties as assigned has also taken on a new and extended meeting. P positions are, not, are taking on more responsibility, and there's sometimes not enough time to do it all. One, help, one way to help ease that responsibility is to let your veteran pages train your new pages or your volunteers. I always say that teaching someone your job only makes you, makes you perform your job better. And having your pages give their knowledge to someone else is a really great way to make them feel like a really integral part of your team. And it's going to take some pressure off of you and give you a little bit of time to do some other things. And maybe you can't let them take over training completely, but maybe once the initial the initial training is over, hand them over to your pages and see what they can do. Mentoring. This is something that Jerice and I have really been learning a lot in the last, about in the last few years. Even though I'm far from an expert on this subject, I still want to share some of the experience that we've had and kind of in hopes that you may have some pages at your library that have the potential to be mentored. So a little food for thought for the mentor. So if you've been considering being a mentor, just kind of a few things to keep in mind when it comes to mentoring pages. 
it's always put your coaching hat on. You're going to be helping to teach them and to coach them. It's also the page's decision. You have to really take into account how far they want to go. Maybe your page doesn't have aspirations to be your library director someday, but maybe they want to go into mending. Maybe they want to go into processing or cataloging. So really think about how far they want to go. And along with that, you can't be pushy. You can't push them into something that they don't want. You have to be encouraging. You have to be supportive. And it really comes down to a little kind of inspiring greatness in them. You have to be ready to dedicate your time and your knowledge and your resources to help them. Your mentoree, the person you're mentoring, will only succeed as fast or as far as he or she is willing to go. And it's not your decision. It helps to be motivating. It really helps to be motivating. And it helps smooth over their insecurities. One of the most important things, I think, for a mentor is you have to be honest. You have to be honest with the person that you're mentoring. Avoid giving them false hopes. Discuss with both parties your expectations regularly. And like I said, be a role model. And you can't mentor somebody who doesn't want to be mentored or who lacks interest. And most importantly, mentoring is a selfless act of kindness and not a reflection of your own visions. When the person that you mentor takes the spotlight on, your own, on their own, your work is essentially done with them. Now, a little food for thought for somebody who is being mentored. And I think that Teresa and I probably have a little more experience with being mentored than being a mentor, obviously. But hopefully, from our experience of how our experience with being mentored has gone, we will grow into being someone's mentor someday. The biggest thing with being mentored is the willing to put it, be willing to put in the work. Your relationship with your mentor goes both ways. And you can't be grumbling. <laughs> there are more, more than likely going to be times when you feel underappreciated and like you're doing a lot of the grunt work. And in truth, you probably are. But this grunt work, so to speak, is a vital experience and definitely something to learn from. Therese and I do a lot of a lot of grunt work and a lot of we, well we like to call ourselves minions sometimes or we're called minions sometimes. But even though we do this kind of offbeat trench work, so to speak, it's always a learning experience and we're always growing for it, growing from it. And even though we may feel like we're just paying our dues, well, that's really what's really happening with that is a really rich and rewarding relationship that hopefully is going to last throughout your professional experience. And just a side note when it comes to picking your mentor or even picking someone to mentor, it's important to kind of choose carefully. You can find someone who shares your passion, that's great. And being able to find that passion and nurture it through mentorship definitely makes it more a more meaningful professional experience. And even if you share that passion with somebody, you may have different views on a topic. You may have different views on the way management is supposed to go. But you're still going to be able to find a common ground and learn from each other and really build upon that passion. A team approach. When I opened my mouth a few years ago about presenting at a conference, my director suggested that Doris and I submit a conference proposal together. You know, kind of take the pressure off of me. It was your first one, so why not do it together? This was really one of the best suggestions she could have ever made for me. Doris and I have really become partners at work as Jennifer kind of described us as the dynamic duo, we really do a lot of projects together. And we brainstorm those projects. And even if we don't end up doing them together, the relationship that we've built with the trust and the understanding and respect means that we have a really great sounding board for ideas. 
the thing with having a team approach is Dries and I are not really going in the same direction in our library anymore. As I mentioned, Dries started school yesterday and she's beginning work on a com computer or technology degree because that's where her passion is. She's been instrumental on our library's tech team and in making system decisions and she's currently being mentored to hopefully become our next tech person and systems administrator. Me, on the other hand, I'm on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. I'm actually getting ready to graduate in August from Emporia State University with my master's in library science. I'm hoping to get a librarian position and eventually I would love to be a library director because my passion is management and leadership. So even though we're kind of moving in completely two different directions, we have a real support and understanding with each other and it's helped us to become more confident and proactive in our jobs. So if you can have somebody in your, in your job as a page that you can kind of partner up with or have somebody that you can bounce ideas off of, it can be really beneficial for you. Mentorship and a team approach all leads to succession. I want to take a little time to talk about succession and what that means for the page. For us at our library, our director is really big on succession. She likes to kind of have a big picture, kind of know where people want to go, and make a plan to get them there. And when it comes to pages, because really, pages are starting kind of at the bottom. You're at the bottom of the totem pole and you've got a long way to work up. And one of the biggest things about it is just making your goals known. Pages should ask themselves if they have, if they've taken the time recently to sit down with their immediate supervisors or even their library director to talk about what direction they want to go in the library. And as a page, you definitely want to make a point to sit down and with those supervisors and make your feelings known. It's also important to meet with that person on a regular basis and it doesn't have to be your mentor or your immediate supervisor every time you meet. Maybe it's the supervisor in the department that you're interested in. One thing that needs to happen though is your direct supervisor needs to know where your head is at, especially if your goals include moving outside of their department. For us at the Richland Public Library, pages fall under circulation, but maybe you're interested in being an ILL, an ILL specialist, which for us falls under our tech umbrella. Your supervisor needs to know that if you're thinking about moving to a new department. They're also there to support you. Don't be afraid to talk to your supervisor and to let them know what your goals are. You can lean on them and tell them what they can do to help you reach your goals. When thinking about your succession, you have to be vocal and you have to ha ask for help and advice. You also need to do your research. What do you do need to do to get where you want to be? Do you need a master's in library science? Do you need technical training? Does your state association or ALA have webinars or training courses available to you? Find out. If you don't know where to look for that information, ask. By doing your research and talking to the people around you, you will know what you need to do to prepare yourself to reach the goals you have. It will also show your supervisors and mentors that you're serious about succession and that you're willing to put in the hard work and get where you want to be. Throughout this process, it really is imperative to keep in mind the job you have and to continue to do it well. Your reputation as a hard worker is going to follow you as you consider which direction you want to go in your succession planning because you're still, you're still a page and you still have a job to do. When it comes to the page perspective, it really does count. Pages are the staff members who spend the most time in the stacks and we really make the argument that they know the library better than anyone. Page input can be a valuable thing. You really should consider their input on things like space planning, collection relocation, 
project development, and volunteer training. All of these, these things can really lead to an increased confidence and empowerment for your pages. One thing to think about as well, as I'm kind of wrapping things up here, is when pages are empowered, they're not just shelving books. Pages are an integral and essential member of your team. Restocking materials for the patrons is one of the most important jobs. But if you utilize your pages properly, they can kind of become a jack of all trades in your library. Listen to their ideas, consider them the same as you would consider any other suggestion made. Being a library page instills a lack, a knack for organization. Bring them in on your projects. You may be surprised on what they bring. Programming ideas can come from anywhere, and leadership can happen at any level of the library. Encourage pages to take the initiative and get involved. This encouragement and involvement will only increase pride in their work. Pages work just as hard as everyone else does, if not harder. And this is something that we always hear from our library director, who just happened to have been a page herself. Now, I think I wrapped up a little early, but like I said, it's the first time I've done this presentation by myself without Doris. So I would love to take some comments or questions. And as well, we I stuck our email addresses down at the bottom. So please feel free to take those down. And the phone numbers on there are actually our cell phone numbers, but feel free to call us on those as well. So with that, I see we're getting some some beats, it looks like Jennifer. Oh, I just wanted done. to also share another story about Doris and Brianna was that they came to the Washington State Library in Olympia uh, to visit. They were doing a presentation for one of our local library systems and they wanted a tour of the State Library. And so they came here and their enthusiasm for the State Library and their enthusiasm for libraries in general was catching. It really brightened everyone's day when they were here and uh, their, their, their enthusiasm, their love for the library. And they were so excited that they were telling everyone about their tour of the library for like days afterwards. So um, that definitely made an impression. Thank you, Rihanna. Other questions, you can either raise your hand or type in chat your questions. Are you kidding? We still talk about that tour at the State Library. We had such a good time. And one of the and what Jennifer was referring to is we've done a presentation similar to this at, at conferences and we were approached by someone at the Timberland Regional Library System um, over on the west side that's I think one of the biggest, if not the biggest, library systems in Washington. We were approached to actually come to their all staff training day to give a presentation specifically for their pages. And it was, we were absolutely floored and totally honored and completely excited to be able to go and talk to them. And it was really a great experience for us because we had their pages coming up to us afterwards, thanking us over and over that you know, this is the first time we've had anything specifically for the pages and it was so great to know that we are important and the things we can do. So, Doris and I have really, in our position, being a page doesn't even begin to describe what we do and we could not be happier or probably luckier to be able to do the things that we do. And there's a question about part-time or full-time for your work as pages. I wonder if the pages in your library are working part-time or full-time. Doris and I, the only pages that we have are either part-time or intermittent. And basically what that means is Doris and I are the only part-time, permanent part-time pages in our position and we work anywhere from 20 hours a week to 32 hours a week. Um, Doris works a little bit more than I do um, just because she ha can work a little bit more than I do. I am going to 
as I said, I'm finishing up my master's degree, so I can't work as much as maybe I would like to. So I work 20 hours a week, Therese works 32. We don't, we have one other intermittent page, and he works 16 hours a week. Okay, um, you do have an additional question, um, and there it was, um, when pages, from Amy, when pages take on more responsibility, do they get paid at a higher rate? It looks like I see a couple questions. Uh, Leslie asked, do you supervise other pages? Uh, we don't really supervise, so to speak, Leslie, but uh, we have been kind of asked to sort of mentor a little bit our intermittent page. He's considerably younger. I think he's only 21 or 22, and this is actually kind of his first real job. So we were kind of asked to take him on and sort of mentor him and and kind of get him trained up, I guess, a little bit in a, at the library. But we don't have technically any real supervisory uh, position, I guess. Um, Amy asked if pages, as Carolyn said, pages take on more responsibility. Do they get paid a higher rate? I wish. Um, <laughs> no, unfortunately, we don't. But um, it really. It's kind of funny that you ask because we've had this conversation a few times with our director and our supervisor that it's it's one of those things where you kind of hope that even though you're doing things outside of your pay grade, so to speak, that they're getting seen and they're being recognized. And we do get recognized in our uh, personal evaluations at the end of the year. And we get raises according to you know, your cost of living increase, but also our supervisors are able to, to give us a certain percentage on top of that. And they're pretty good about um, kind of giving that to us. But we're, it's been made very clear to us that, you know, we're kind of doing things that are outside of our pay grade, but we like doing them. And as I said, hopefully they'll be recognized and kind of seen in the future as a way to kind of move us into other positions. The problem with, well, it's not really a problem, but the situation, I guess, at our library is, and with a lot of municipal libraries, I'm assuming, is you only have so many positions. And even though, like, for myself personally, when I graduate in August, there's, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a librarian position here. I would love to stay at Richland, and that's really my goal, is to stay with Richland as a librarian. But there's a really good possibility that I'm going to be a page with an MLS for a while until there's a librarian position that opens by someone who retires, which at our library, we have about seven or eight people that are looking to retire in the next two to four years. So there's going to be some considerable turnover soon. So, and I hope that answers your a, question. Oh, go ahead. We have a question about um, having training volunteer shelvers. Yeah, they want to know if you trained them differently because you're a page. Well, I think that we train them. I, th I would like to say that we train them a little bit more, I guess, real world style than maybe our supervisors that, or our CERC supervisor who doesn't really shelve very often anymore. Um, you know, Doris and I have our, have our little quirks of how things work for us when it goes, when it comes to, to putting books away and the, um, the order in which we put things away. So we really do try to instill that in them and also the little tricks and quirks that we have are really kind of time savers because I mean not only are you expected to be accurate as a shelver and with putting things away but you're expected to be fast because especially coming up on you know summer reading program and the summertime just explodes when there's carts everywhere I mean you you have to be fast as well as right so we really try to give them little tips and tricks on how to kind of make things easier for them, and especially for the volunteers, because they don't have to be here. 
they want to be here and they, you know, are coming to do this because they want to see how it is in the library and kind of get those volunteer hours. So we try to really give them kind of our, our real life, real world type of training. Maybe not so technical. And then Rhonda asked, earlier you mentioned that you don't spend a lot of time in the stacks anymore. Are you doing more programming training instead? We are doing a lot of programming and um, a little bit of training. We don't have a whole lot of volunteers right now, so we're not doing a lot of training with them. But a lot of, a lot of it is programming. And um, for Doris especially, her role has really changed a lot with you know, we have multiple computers that need upgrades and um, there's a new self-check system that we've implemented, so she's been troubleshooting that. So she really spends a lot of time in it with her hands in the computers. And she kind of, it's funny because she will say sometimes, she's like, oh, I get to shelve today because she uh, doesn't get that chance very often. And that kind of again, kind of goes back to being quick. So you kind of have to take the time you have to get as much done as you can. But I personally am not doing a whole lot of programming right now just because I'm finishing school and um, I kind of took a step back from Whale this year. So I'm not really working with Whale a lot, but I'm hoping to do some other things with the Washington State Library Association, or the Washington Library Association. And I see that we've got another one. Would you prefer shelving fast without accuracy or shelving slow with more accuracy? That is a really good question. I personally think that the most important thing is accuracy because that goes back to serving your patrons. If your patrons want to find something on the shelf and your catalog says where it is and they go to look for it and it's not there because you weren't being accurate, then you're not doing your patron a very good service at all. So I think that the most important thing is to work on accuracy, especially when you're starting out as a page. Working on your accuracy, your accuracy first and your speed will come. It looks like we have some folks still typing. So we'll see. It takes a few minutes sometimes for things to come through chat. And while we're waiting for that, I just wanted to mention our next month's presentation. Next month's um, subject is going to be completely different. We're going from we're going to talk um, the we're going to get a sister organization, a sister division in the Washington State uh, Secretary of Ar State's office to help us out. And their topic is going to be nonprofit corporate governance, what board members need to know, legal considerations. And so some of the questions we're going to deal with was what does it mean to serve on a board from a legal perspective? What are the key fiduciary duties of board members? How should conflicts of interest be addressed? And how do I mi minimize liability and minimize risk? And then um, but just do some other things. While it may not be, um, you know, it's going to be at a high level. We're going to be talking about things trustees should know. And also, uh, it's not a bad idea for the uh, friends board members or foundation board members. So if you have for foundation friends or trustees um, and need to, would like to have some continuing education for them on their legal responsibilities, I think next Next month's um, first Tuesdays on May 7th would be a good one to attend. So do we OK? Any other questions? I see people uh, typing. We have one more, Mary. So excellent presentation. Lots Thank of interest. You. Thank you. I see the little comment from Diane down here about how she always looked at pages as the dishwashers of the library. Can't serve the content without the books in the right place. And I could not agree more. And I always, I always look at it like, when you go into a when you go into a new position or you go into an office, especially in an office environment, I always say, you know, who do you want to make friends with in the office? Do you want to make friends with the CEO? No, you want to make friends with his secretary because she really makes that office run. In a doctor's office, it's not the doctor; it's your nurses. At the library, it's the same thing. It's your pages. Your pages are really the backbone of your library. If 
the stuff isn't on the shelves, not in the right place, you're not meeting your mission to serve your patrons. And really that's what it comes down to for me, is just serving the, pa serving the patrons to the best of your ability. Well, I say thank you. I don't see anything else. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? And if anybody else has any further comments or questions or anything you think of later, like I said, please feel free to write down our emails and give us a, a, give us a call if you like, email us questions. We're completely open to talking about it further. And again, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today, especially from all over the country. I can't even believe that. It was very awesome, so thank you.